Welcome to the Standard Deviations Podcast, presented by Orion Advisor Solutions and hosted by Dr. Daniel Crosby, Orion's Chief Behavioral Officer and New York Times bestselling author. Each week, Dr. Crosby interviews a fascinating new guest on a range of compelling topics, from literature to psychology to financial wellness. To learn more about Dr. Crosby's behavioral finance work at Orion, visit www.orion.com. Hello and welcome to the Standard Deviations Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Daniel Crosby. I am joined today by Nate Astle, founder of Relational Money, a training organization that is set out to teach a new type of financial advisor. Nate, how are you doing? I'm good. How are you doing? I am amazing. Um, You (laughs) like school perhaps even more than I do. Uh, You have a master's degree in marriage and family therapy, Uh, You're working on a second master's in financial therapy. I was telling my wife last night that you were coming on the show and, you know, she's like, who's coming on? And I'm like, well, this expert's coming on. He's an expert in financial therapy. And she says, is that kind of like behavioral finance? And I said, not quite. So why don't you help us? Why don't you help us position um, clinical psychology, behavioral finance, and financial therapy? How, how are they the same? How are they different? Sure. Um, there is some questions out there in the academic field as well. Um, <laughs> I think of financial therapy as kind of an umbrella term for anything that um, covers both cognitive, emotional, relational aspects of money. Um, as, as far as I understand, well, the Financial Therapy Association you know, it talks about we're out to change behavior, thoughts, and feelings around money, but the overall goal is is overall well-being. So, you know, forgive me if I maybe misquote here, but as far as I understand, behavioral finance uses psychology to understand, you know, market cycles and uses psychology to understand different financial trends. Um, financial therapy is, the end goal is more about the people it's people focused and how, how do people experience money differently so that they're you know, less stressed out about it, they can live more fulfilling lives, et cetera. I think, I think that's a meaningful distinction because when I think about behavioral finance, a lot of it's about alpha, right? Like, is it about generating alpha from making superior moves in the market, taking advantage of other folks' irrationality en route to bigger returns, or what we might call behavioral alpha? sort of the outperformance that accrues to people who can just stay in their seat and not panic and not panic sell or or get in their own way or make stupid decisions. Financial therapy is all about personal wellness as it intersects with with money, if if I'm getting that right. Yeah, exactly. You said it a ton better than I did, but yeah. (laughs) Yeah. And it's kind of a new, it's kind of a new discipline. I mean, what's what's neat to me about financial therapy is that a lot of the pioneers in the field are sort of walking around, right? I mean, they're they're young, you know. They're at they're at your university, they're at the University of Georgia, uh, and a few other, I think, prominent schools. Texas Tech uh, mm-hmm. also has a a good program, but it's a neat um, it's it's a neat discipline to get exposed to because it's still sort of being formed. So if anyone's listening to this and they're excited about this idea of of financial wellness. I think the Financial Therapy Association is a great place to start. I've been to a couple of their conferences and always had a, a really good time with some, with some very nice folks. So, Nate, we, we know that uh, every year since the American Psychological Association started studying it, um, money is one of Americans' primary stressors. It's typically, it's typically number one. Mm-hmm. Uh, and yet we know that we are also loath to talk about it. So we we have this weird we have this weird sort of paradox in the U.S. where on the one hand we're always talking about money, right? We're watching. I'm dating myself here, but we're watching Cribs, right? We're watching. We're watching. Yeah, that didn't. That like I, I didn't want to say that, and then I said it, and I immediately regretted it, right? So we're, we're we're watching shows about how much money people make. You know, we're watching shows about the kind of cars they drive. So it, in some respects, money is everywhere. We're we're following Instagram influencers who are rubbing their wealth in our face, uh, and then on the other hand, we're profoundly stressed out about money, and we're not talking about it. So speak to this paradox a little bit. How can money be simultaneously uh, everywhere and nowhere? And and why are we so secretive about it? 
Well, just like everything in life, there's no definitive answer. Um, but what I will say is money has a lot of emotional weight to it. Um, there's a lot of meaning that we make out of money about our, our own financial behaviors, about the money that we you know, aspire to have one day. Um, the financial behaviors of others are, you know, our romantic partners, our families, um, the Instagram influencers. We put a lot of meaning behind how people use, spend, collect, save, aspire to gain money. And I, I think it's helpful to think of it similarly to sex. Um, we have a ton of shows that have a ton of sex in them or sexual themes or concepts or innuendos. And yet sex is something that a lot of us aren't very comfortable talking about because it's also very personal. We have a lot of personal attachment meanings around sex that we don't, um, we don't have a lot of experience talking about. And I, in the same way, uh, at least a lot of sexual problems um, in couple relationships too. So I think one of the things that, that could be helpful is if we learn to engage money on a more emotional level and understand how, how our personal experiences with it affect our, you know, our behaviors. And this is some of the stuff that we talk about in relational money, but it, just in general, I think that's something the field could benefit from is it's a personal thing. Why, why is it, do you think that we ascribe so much meaning to money? You know, I've, I've sometimes sort of referred to money as almost like liquid happiness. Not that, not that it is liquid happiness, but it's perceived as such, right? And it's something you can, it's something you can stack and count and, and quantify in a way that I think the more ethereal elements of personal uh, wellness or personal accomplishment are, are hard to stack and sort and quantify. But what, why do you think we, we ascribe so much meaning to, to money? Um, well, I think, you, like you said, it's because we can quantify it, it helps our brain that likes to put things in boxes. It says, okay, I have X amount of success, um, which of course isn't fair. And I think most of us, if you're going to ask, does me money mean everything? Most people say, of course not. Um, and yet in our unconscious or, um, you know, those deeper held beliefs that we're not as likely to show others, it is something that we kind of hold on to. And it's because it's easy. That's, that's my personal belief is it's easier to think that money is, is what we should pursue. And not that there's anything wrong with pursuing money inherently, but when it becomes the only source of happiness or when you put all that, all your eggs into that happiness basket. You know, it's high risk and kind of low reward of how I think about it, I guess. Yeah, it's it's funny because I think, you know, there's a really big disconnect between people's stated values and then the way that those values play out a lot of times. Like if you ask people like, is money, you know, is money the most important thing to you? I think almost everyone would say no, it's family, it's love, it's being charitable and good and kind and a hundred other things. And then, but when you look at how we spend our time, if you look at how we spend our worry, even like, you know, mm -hmm. money takes a very outsized place, I think, in our lives relative to how ostensibly important it is to us. Yeah. Yeah. So, Nate, one of the things that I've uh, picked up in my time hanging out with financial therapists, and I just, again, know enough to be dangerous, I think I'm like two conferences in. <laughs> um, but, but one of the things that I've really loved about what I picked up from the Financial Therapy Association are, are, are talk of, of money scripts. So sort of, um, you know, themes or scripts that we learn from our families of origin or, or from society broadly. Um, you know, we talked about uh, the, the human tendency to want to put things in boxes. So uh, help help me put us as a society in boxes. What are some common money themes or some common money scripts that our listeners might might find in themselves in? Sure. Um, well, the money the term money scripts um, largely comes from the literature that Brad Klontz and Ted Klontz and Rick Kaler and others have have been putting out there, but. 
they have a like clans manuscript inventory which has four categories money avoidance money worship money status and another one that's slipping my mind of course it is um oh dr clans <laughs> hunt him down <laughs> yeah i'm sorry brad um but yeah so uh, just for example money avoidance um money avoidance has it well it's what it is what it sounds like we don't like engaging with money topics and so it can be it can look a lot of different ways maybe it's i don't like talking about money with my partner because it's scary or maybe i don't like looking at uh my budget or i don't really i'm not really good at making financial plans because i don't i just don't want to i'm avoiding it right um, it's interesting. There's actually some research shows that therapists and mental health providers are more likely to be money avoidant. Um, and we can talk about, you know, values of poverty and other things that why that might be. Um, money status. The easiest way to remember this is my self worth, is my net worth. Um, these types of, well, I don't know how I say types of people, but like people who have money status scripts are more likely to engage in showing off. Um, their financial wealth, you know, buying, buying things so that people can see it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and money, we're, oh, money vigilance, that's the last one. Okay, so money worship, uh, this is the script that I'm, I need to, money is the, it's how my problems are going to be solved. If only I could have more money, then I could be more happy. Um, and then the last one is money vigilant, I'm very on top of my money. Um, uh, a negative of this is you can be overly anxious. I'm, you know, I'm checking my bank account three times a day and I'm really, really anxious about every financial decision or maybe that might not be necessary. So that's really basic. Again, I, I would encourage you to, or anyone to check out um, the Clance's work for a more detailed explanation on that. So how, let, let's say someone is uh, avoidant, you know, mm -hmm. say for instance, someone uh, reads the, the Clance's work on this they say, you know what, I, I see myself in this, I see my propensity to be money avoidant, I want to be different. How does someone, uh, you know, how difficult is it to change? And, and how does someone set about sort of rewriting a money script that may have um, sort of become ingrained into their psyche over, you know, over decades, over growing up, or even over sort of what's in the air societally, just because I think some of these things, you know, money worship, perhaps, are just sort of Co common American values. Yeah, um, I really like that you brought up that money scripts change. Um, they are not this permanent, oh, well, I got money worship, and so I'm always going to be, you know, chasing money. That's, that's not true. And it's the same thing with our thoughts and values and beliefs. They change over time and as we have different experiences. Um, how to change is, is going to be kind of dependent on what you fall into. So if, you, if you're money avoidant, um, and I tend to fall into this one, um, making, rewarding yourself, and you know, this isn't the only way, it's just a way, rewarding yourself for participating in financial discussions or financial decision making can be a little way to boost your brain saying, oh, okay, this is a good thing. I don't need to be scared because after I, every time I do my budget, I get I, I go get an ice cream. I don't know. Food is the thing that works for me. <laughs> but um, yeah, finding ways to reward yourself for engaging in difficult conversations can be a, a small, but it can be a great way to engage in it. Um, of course, if you're finding that any script that you have or any belief is really debilitating, you know, whether you're either your financial level or you're just your personal life, um, I definitely would encourage you to check out mental health providers or a financial therapist that might help you work through maybe those underlying beliefs and where they come from. Um, but, you know, there's, there's lots of different things that you can do to practice change and change is absolutely possible. So this is a, perhaps a good segue. You talked about looking up a, a mental health professional or a financial therapist. What are these sort of educational backgrounds of a typical financial therapist? And when might you enlist the help of a financial therapist in particular versus, say, some of the master's degree in social work or a PhD in psychology or, or something similar? Sure. Yeah. So like I said, financial therapy is an umbrella term. And so you're going to have 
quote, financial therapists on both a financial plan, coming from a financial planning discipline and a mental health discipline. So um, how to do it is if you go to the Financial Therapy Association website, just Financial Therapy Association, um, they have a, a tab that says find an FT or find a financial therapist. And you can, there are listings there. Um, so some, there is a certified financial therapist designation, which requires people to have a, at least bachelor's degree. They have to have 500 hours of direct client experience um, and they have to pass the national exam. And that covers a lot of different content areas. Um, as far as, you know, when would I see a therapist versus a financial advisor versus a financial therapist? Mm -hmm. um, it kind of depends. I, a financial therapist is specifically trained in handling financial related distress. So it can be relationship distress. It can be personal distress. It can be financial trauma. Um, that being said, not every financial planner who gets trained in financial therapy should be the person you go to to resolve any unresolved trauma experiences that you might have. Um, but hopefully the financial therapist would know how to refer to a competent mental health professional and vice versa. If you're going to see someone for financial therapy help and they're a mental health provider and you really need a solid financial plan, hopefully they'd be able to refer you to an appropriate financial professional. So it's kind of a non-answer, but I, I hope that you can see there's, there's lots of overlap in the fields and a financial therapist is trying to bridge that gap. Yeah, it's, it's fascinating. Um, you know, 25% of all visits to a general practitioner result in a referral to a mental health professional. So there's so much overlap between our our mental health, our physical health, our financial health, our psychological health. Um, so it's not a non-answer. It's tricky. And, and I think they're, they're overlapping disciplines. Now, Nate, one of the things that you do at Relational Money, the primary thing you do um, at Relational Money is you teach soft skills to financial advisors. Now, uh, I, I do something similar with, with part of my time. Um, I want, to, I want to talk about that for a moment. Are, are soft skills more important now? I mean, is there something about the environment in which financial advisors are doing business today that, that makes them more urgent now than ever before? Or are we as an industry just kind of pulling our head out of the sand and, and just realizing that they matter now? It, which, which is it? Um, both. <laughs> um, I think... <laughs> Uh, you know, if you look at the history of financial advising, it, it largely came out of sales and selling certain financial products. Um, I think over time, we've realized that financial advising can be so much more. And so we moved more into a, a holistic financial plan and getting insurance policies, but also getting budget and savings and retirement goals. And we added a lot of things. That's great. Um, and people don't always respond to plans. How often do you and I make a plan for something and don't follow through? It happens all the time um, on big and small scales. Soft skills is how, in my opinion, is how financial advisors take their work to the next level. Um, honestly, there's technology is amazing and kind of crazy, um, but there are going to be more and more robo-advisors that can do so many of the things that financial advisors are trained to do. If we look at, uh, you know, the CFP curriculum or most academic education curriculum requirements, it's on all these technical financial skills, um, and you might be lucky to have one class on behavior or um, you know, how do I, or financial counseling, how do I actually connect with my clients? But that's where everything lies. Um, people, plans are good and nice and important, but until people change internally, following plans are very, um, not as likely to happen. And I, I think what I'm hoping to do with relational money is help train financial planners to engage with their clients differently, where they look beyond numbers and say, okay, I'm trying to change their behavior. I'm not just trying to make a plan for them because that, that isn't enough. Yeah. 
Yeah, so that that kind of brings me to a fork. I'll, I'll ask two follow-on questions from that. The first is I, I'd like you to be as specific as possible. What what specific soft skills do you find to be underdeveloped in in the average financial advisor? Like when when you work with advisors at relational money, what are the specific skills you're working with people on? Because you're right, like to get a CFA or a CFP, you have a little bit of training in behavioral finance, but that's stuff like how human behavior um, violates, you know, utility maximization theory. It's not like how to have a conversation. Um, so yeah, what where are those underdeveloped skills in the average advisor? Yeah, um, I think one that's really basic and also incredibly important is empathy. How do I experience empathy and how do I show it to others? Um, when a client comes into your office and they're distressed because they don't have enough money saved in their retirement or they are um, supporting one of their children um, financially well past what they thought, or perhaps they're just at the beginning and they're trying to make plans for the future and they have a kid on the way, I don't know. Um, people are experiencing a lot of distress and one of the best things you can do as an advisor and as a human being is learn how to appropriately share empathy that I, I might not know exactly what your experience is like, but I know what it's like to be scared and stressed out and frustrated and hopeless. And I really want to connect with, uh, I, I want financial advisors to connect with that part of themselves because, and, and therapists do this all the time. Um, it's how you connect with your client. It's how you get your client to buy into what you're saying. Okay, my advisor gets me. And it's not because they threw a bunch of numbers at me to prove how smart they were. It's because I feel emotionally invested in our relationship. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the first things that we do uh, with relational money is we work on empathy and we work on validation skills. Um, yeah, that makes sense to me. That is a great phrase. Um, when, they, when your client comes in telling you about how difficult XYZ problem is, Nika, that makes sense. It is hard. Thanks for sharing. That can be a, a game changer with how you engage with the client in the future. Um, another thing I think is really important that we work a little bit later in the series is um, personal distress tolerance and specifically distress tolerance around um, emotions. When clients cry or when clients fight with their partner in front of you. And there's really interesting research out there by Dubosky, I think in 2007, but like something like 70 or 80% of planners have had to act as mediators between partners um, mm. because uh, money conflict. It's incredibly common and financial planners have almost zero training on how to handle it. So one of the things we work on is your own personal reactions to money or to emotions. What are there emotions that are harder to deal with? Are there emotions that are easier to deal with? How can we increase your tolerance so that it doesn't freak you out quite as much when your client starts crying or when they start fighting with each other? What are helpful ways to engage with that? So yeah, I, you know, those are the ones that come top of mind that I think financial planners as a whole would really, really benefit from some skills in. A, a few years ago, my uh, my sister in law passed away. A few years ago, and in, in the in the months and years of of her cancer diagnosis leading up to that, whenever my primarily my wife, her sister would would talk to anyone about this, you could see people just contort themselves to run away to talk about anything but something sad and someone dying, right? Like people's discomfort with this, even people we were close to was just astronomical, right? So we, we have to get comfortable. Money is an, an inherently um, emotional, complex subject. And, and we as advisors have to get comfortable with the discomfort uh, of sitting in a room with you know, a couple of people who are having a, a deep conversation about that. Now, uh, some of the coolest research to come out of uh, the, the hands of the, some, a couple of prominent financial therapists had to do with um, the levels of, of stress and evil, even clinical symptoms that, that financial advisors uh, experienced in the wake of the great financial crisis. So it was something like 93% of financial professionals 
uh, experience some level of anxiety, depression, and in some cases, even um, PTSD like symptoms. Uh, I mean, I am someone who left the field of clinical psychology candidly because of empathy fatigue. Like it was too much for me, right? Like was, I was working with, um, you know, in some cases, prison populations and other folks. And I was just like, I'm done. Like, I don't, like, I don't want to do it. Right. It was too much. I was taking my work home with me. How do advisors, uh, engage adequately to, to empathize with someone, but not so fully that they're taking it home with them? How, how do you draw that line? Sure. Um, well, it, it's a really normal occurrence for, for both therapists and advisor, for sure. Um, and this is, this is the human part of our work. I think a couple of things that might help. Um, one, I absolutely be an advocate for if you think there are some things that are just too painful for you and you don't know why it would be a great idea to see a mental health provider who can maybe help uncover some of the reasons it might be, um, might be more distressing. Another thing is to recognize roles. Um, as a financial advisor, people come to you for, for financial advice and they come to you for a sense of hope that change is possible whether it's a change in their financial situation or change in their financial behaviors, uh, which we work on. It's also important to hold space for yourself that I don't have to solve everything in a day and that people are going to do what people are going to do. And that doesn't mean to give up on them or to not put your, you know, your heart and soul into your work, but to set appropriate boundaries on what's my responsibility and what's their responsibility. Um, it's easier said than done, you know, listening to this on a podcast podcast and like, oh yeah, that's a great idea. But when it actually comes up to it, it might be a very difficult thing. Um, I would say really helpful things to work on is some of your own, own emotional intelligence skills, knowing what's happening inside of you, what's triggering the response. Is it a certain thing that they're saying? Is that how they're saying it? is the situation that feels familiar? Um, and then, you know, I, I do this in my therapy work, a lot of mindfulness skills, focusing on what's happening inside your body, um, learning to connect with your emotions in less threatening ways, which is something most of us aren't taught how to do. Um, so if that is something that's difficult for you, one, you're not alone, and two, there, there is a possibility for you to engage with your, you know, engage with your work more fully without it being really detrimental. Yeah. You know, I've, um, I've often been an advocate of financial advisors having their own advisors, right? I think a lot of financial advisors hold out uh, the value that they provide as being primarily behavioral, right? Like they keep people from making poor decisions with their money. And so I think by that logic, financial advisors should have their own advisors because, you know, we see our own behavior um, you know, through a through a distorted lens, and it's only by working with an external party that we that we really gain access to that. But you know, what's never occurred to me to suggest, and I will be tweeting moments after we end this call, is that you know, financial advisors should really go see a therapist as well. Like, not only you know, not only will that therapist model good interactions, knock on wood, right? Like, not not only will that you know therapist model uh, how to express empathy how to listen, how to share, uh, that, that will also provide an outlet for them to sort of rid themselves of some of this secondary, you know, this secondary trauma that comes from uh, the very real fact that, that financial advisors are a buffer uh, between a client and their worst impulses many times. And that's a heavy, it's a heavy, heavy place to be. So I think um, I will be suggesting all all uh, finan uh, all financial planners be going to see shrinks very soon. <laughs> Absolutely. And that actually is something we talk about in this series is uh, professionals getting professional help, but also getting um, networks of other financial advisors who experience similar things that you do. Yeah. Getting a support network can be incredibly validating and uplifting, just knowing other people are going through the same stuff I am. Yeah. And, yeah. It can, that, those are all over the place. You can find lots of support groups. In that yeah, way. definitely. So, you know, you, you touched on this. I, I promised that there was sort of a fork in the road. We, we've run down one path. The other path, you know, when we're talking about shaping behaviors, 
uh, is of course the knowing doing gap, right? Like we're here on March 5th, all my, um, all my new year's resolutions are shot to pieces, right? Like everything, you know, everything that I wanted to do, I've fully given up on now. Like there's such a huge chasm between knowing the right thing to do and and doing the right thing, right? There's all kinds of great examples, like medical professionals smoke at a higher rate than the general population, right? So, so the doctor that's telling you to stop smoking is himself smoking when, when you leave his office, right? So there's all kinds of examples. Um, so if someone wants to make a change, right, if it's, if, if it's someone who's listening to this, who wants to change their financial behavior, or if it's an advisor listening to this, um, who, who wants to, you know, help their clients change or change some of the ways that, that they go about their business, what, what recommendations do you have about behavior change that sticks and is a little deeper than just, than just learning what to do? Because that can be so uh, easily forgotten. Yeah, your your question is incredibly deep <laughs> because there are so many theories of thought out there in the in the therapy psychology world and what helps people change. Um, I will give you very small thoughts on what I have. Um, one is behavior is never simply a cause and effect thing; it is cyclical. So good patterns predict good behaviors. So one of the best things you can do to make large behavior change is make small behavior change that then compound over time. Um, So when working with clients, you might have an entire plan laid out, but you might decide on, you know, uh, often I see financial advisors with meeting their clients once a quarter or something. breaking that down to smaller meetings or even just more frequent engagements and working on very, very tiny parts of the plan. Um, This comes from solution-focused therapy models um, where we focus on tiny things that then snowball into bigger changes. And I think that's great. And it works for a lot of people. Um, Something, and I come from an attachment theory lens where we Um, A lot of our behaviors is based on the safety, relative safety that we feel. Um, So I would, and this is where I would suggest doing some of your personal work around emotions. Um, And maybe if you're, if you're, if you're in a place as an advisor to look at yourself and your own emotions and you feel good about that, um, stepping into some financial therapy training on emotions and emotion coaching um, can be really helpful. You don't need to be a therapist to know appropriate ways to handle emotions. Um, kind of like mental health CPR. Um, mm-hmm. We know you don't have to be a medical professional to know how to do chest compressions. You don't have to be a therapist in order to sit with emotions and to coach people through it to a certain degree. So that's a personal bias that I have is to work on both emotions and those baby steps. But yeah, it's, there's way too much to cover in, in an hour uh, thing on different theories of change and each have their merit. Yeah. Yeah. The, the solution focus on the, the incremental change, I think, is one of the most powerful things you've said you know, today in this episode. I think one of the biggest mistakes that we make is just trying to bite off too much. Like we get excited about a change. Um, we want to make a wholesale change. We want to go from the couch to the marathon, so to speak. And, and um, then we get discouraged, right? We hit a wall, we get sore, <laughs> Either, right. you know, physically or metaphorically, we sort of burn out uh, and then we give up and we're, we're back in that dejected place again. So making small incremental changes with the help of a professional or support group, uh, as you said in your previous segment, is very big. Well, Nate, this has been awesome. If, if people want to learn more about you, if they want to learn more about relational money, um, how can people follow your work online? Uh, yep. So if you just, I'm on LinkedIn and Twitter professionally. So you can just look for Nathan Astle, A-S-T-L-E. Um, and then relational money is on Facebook, LinkedIn, and Twitter. And you just type in relational money, uh, LLC. Um, I don't think the LLC is necessary. You should see it's a little coin with a heart in the middle and I'm really proud of my logo. Um, (laughs) So yeah, you can go there. Uh, My website is also relationalmoney.com. So that hopefully is easy enough to remember. Um, And if any, everyone has questions either about 
you know, my course content, but also just wants to talk more about financial therapy. I, I am also a board member of the Financial Therapy Association. So if you're interested in getting more involved there, I'm happy to send your resources. I'm happy to do that. Yeah. I think the FTA is like the best kept secret, I think, in, in financial planning. And I know it's, you know, it's sort of coming into its own and, and making bigger, bigger and bigger waves. But I think at least for many years, it, I, I don't think enough advisors and enough professionals uh, knew about it. So uh, consider this an invitation uh, to check out Nate and his work, uh, as well as the work of the Financial Therapy Association. So uh, Nate, thank you again for your time and your insights. It's been wonderful. Yeah, thanks for having me. Thanks for tuning in to Standard Deviations. If you can't wait till next week for more behavioral finance insights, visit www.orion.com. Com. All opinions expressed by Dr. Daniel Crosby and podcast guests are solely their own opinions and do not reflect the opinion of or endorsement by Orion and its affiliates, subsidiaries, and employees. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as a basis for legal, tax, and investment decisions. The opinions are based upon information the participants consider reliable.